Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. You're brave because you came to church on a Wednesday night for a study in the book of First Chronicles. And you'll see, have you read ahead? How many, how many know it's coming? How many have read ahead? Wow, you are really brave. So let's, uh, let's turn to First Chronicles chapter 1, and let's, let's definitely pray <laughs> before we start. Father, this is your word. And you said to us in the New Testament that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Lord, even though we have a list of names, genealogical records, chronicles of a nation, the history of that nation, you did it for a reason. You did it for a purpose. And so, Father, we pray that as we look at um, these chapters tonight, that you will reveal to us what you need to reveal to us, that we would uh, not only get information, but inspiration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When you think of a chronicle, you might think of a newspaper. The San Francisco Chronicle is the name of that city's newspaper. The Houston Chronicle, again, a newspaper of a city. The Augusta Chronicle, Augusta, Georgia. A chronicle is a record of life. And way back before the days of technology, before the days of cameras and tape recorders and MP3 players, there were people who sat in rooms and wrote longhand what was going on in the nation, in the courtroom, in the throne room, etc. They were chroniclers. So back in the Old Testament days, a chronicle of the nation was important to the history and uh, the working of that nation. Now, when we get to First and Second Chronicles, if you're familiar at all, if you've read ahead, if you've read through the Bible before, you have noticed that First Chronicles and Second Chronicles seems to have material that is repetitive from the books of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. And so you might wonder, well, why does God have to say it again? Of course, you could ask that question when you get to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have four accounts of the life of Christ, but for a very distinct reason. First and Second Chronicles, though there are some similarities between those two books and the books I just mentioned, Samuel and Kings, they're from a very different perspective. First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, are a history of the nation during that time period. The book of First and Second Chronicles, though it is historic, it is really from a spiritual perspective. It is a divine editorial on the history of that nation. So you recall that there was a civil war in the nation, right? There were a series of four kings over the united monarchy of the 12 tribes of Israel. There was first King Saul, then King David, then King Solomon, then King Rehoboam. Four kings over 12 tribes of Israel. When Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, got on the throne, he was challenged by somebody not from the lineage of King David at all, but his name was Jeroboam. And he, representing the people, didn't like the heavy taxation, some of the rules and the regulations, and so they rebelled. 
Rehoboam did not give in. I won't rehash all the details. So the 10 northern tribes called Israel departed and did their own thing with their own worship system and their own sets of kings and dynasties separate from Judah and Benjamin down south. So now you have not one but two separate kingdoms. Israel in the north, ten tribes. Judah in the south with the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. When you look at the history of Samuel and the kings, especially first and second kings, you have in the north 19 separate kings in seven different dynasties covering a period of 250 years. But then you'll notice that, and I'm just refreshing your memory, when we studied the kings, they bounced back. Do you remember from north to south, north to south, north to south? They would always go and give a little account of what's going on with the 10 tribes and then a little account of what's going on with the two tribes. So they were bouncing back and forth. And so we noticed that there were 19 kings in the north. Every one of those kings in the northern 10 tribes were all bad dudes, bad kings. Not one of them was good. They were all bad. They were all idol worshipers. They just brought the nation further and further and further into disarray. Meanwhile, down south, there were 20 different kings. But not seven different dynasties, just one dynasty. The dynasty of King David. So what the chronicler does in First and Second Chronicles is he is eliminating the ten tribes and dealing just with one tribe in particular, that is Judah, one king and dynastic kingdom in particular, David and his successors. So we're dealing with just the kingdom of Judah because what God wants to show in this book is how faithful he is to the covenant he promised in preserving the nation through King David toward the Messiah. God's faithfulness to the covenant to preserve the nation through King David to toward the coming of the Messiah. And so that sort of sets up for us First and Second Chronicles. Who wrote this book? Well, we're not told. It doesn't say the author's name at the beginning, doesn't have the author's name toward the end. But my best guess is Ezra, the priest and scribe, wrote this book after they came back from the captivity. We know it was written after they came back from the captivity. You will see so, I hope, tonight. In this book, the dynasty of King David is in focus along with the temple, its worship system, the priesthood. It makes sense that somebody with the knowledge of a priest would write this book. So Ezra, I think, is a good guess, but I think there's a clue. Turn to the very last chapter of 2 Chronicles. So go to 2 Chronicles, if you can make your way there, chapter 36. I just want to show you something quickly. 2 Chronicles 36. Are you there? Verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Now, turn a page. And as you turn a page, it's the book of 
Ezra, look at the first two verses. Now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. The first two verses of Ezra are almost identical to the last two verses of 2 Chronicles. So there are stylistic similarities in the writing of Ezra and in the writing of 1 and 2 Chronicles. So I'm just going to uh, speak up and unashamedly say, I believe Ezra wrote this book. Whoever wrote this book, and I'm guessing it's Ezra, was very meticulous in writing this book. That is, he had at his disposal several records that he borrowed from. He had the writings of the Torah, because he'll quote some of the genealogical tables in the book of Genesis. He also borrows from Samuel, because in this book he mentions, as was written by Samuel the seer. He has the writings of Nathan the prophet, of Gad, of Abijah, and several others that are named in this book as sources that he is looking at, borrowing from, and including in the Chronicles. Okay, let's outline the book really quickly. You can slice the book into two sections, two major sections. Chapters 1 through 9 is David's rightful ancestry. David's rightful ancestry. What gives him the authority by God to be the king? His rightful ancestry, the tracing of the genealogical record to David, the establishment by God of his rightful throne. Then the second half of the book, or actually more than half because it's uh, chapter 10 all the way to the end of the book, is David's royal activity. So you have David's rightful ancestry and then David's royal activity, what he does as the king. David will be mentioned in this book of 1 Chronicles 180 times. So he is a major focus. The cross beams are focused on King David. Now, we get to chapter 1 of 1 Chronicles, and you see a list of names, not just names, but hard names. And um, you have chapter after chapter after chapter of genealogies, family trees. And I know the question, why? Why would God subject me <laughs> to trying to muddle through all these names, mispronouncing them as I go. What is the value of all these names? I don't know who these people are. You're right, a whole list of names are really unimportant unless your name is among them. If your name happened to be among them, you would look for your name. Just like if we took a group picture, the first person you would look for, guaranteed, would be you. Oh, I didn't like the way I smiled there. I wish they could take it again. You know, right? We, we're very conscious about that. I think here's the overarching reason why we have all these names. God cares about people. God cares about people. He loves people. They may not be important names to you. They're important names, obviously, to God because they're included in the Holy Writ in the Scripture itself. I've always loved this song, years ago, written by Tommy Walker. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. I love that thought. He knows your name. Names are important. People are important. I'm glad that God records names. Because there is a book, I hope your name is in it, called the Lamb's Book of Life. It's written about, talked about in Revelation chapter 21. That's a book you want to make sure your name is in. But there is a record of those who have received Christ that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So these are names. And 
we have in these chapters the most comprehensive genealogical records in all of Scripture, but they are selective. That is, we follow a family tree up to a point. You will find that many of them are dropped. Others are selected and followed through because the author is leading you along to David's rightful ancestry. So he's going to begin with Adam. And in the first few verses, just the first four verses, take you from the creation to the flood. But all the way through, we have a total of 3,000 years from Adam to David. Let's take a crack at a couple of the names, a few of these verses. We're only going to breeze through a few of them. I will not subject you to me mispronouncing all these hard names. But a few of them you recognize. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah. He's always an interesting one because he lived longer than anybody else, 969 years. And what's interesting about him is the meaning of his name is that in dying, it shall be sent. In dying, it shall be sent. The year he died, God sent the flood. So when he was born, 969 years prior to the flood, I'm sure everybody was giving him Tylenol and everything else to make sure he stayed alive a long time because as long as he's alive, there's no water coming down. But when he dies, God will send that judgment. And we have covered that prophecy before, but it's interesting that it, he is mentioned. Lamech, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, those are the sons of Noah, then we're given the genealogy of the sons of Japheth in verse 5. The sons of Japheth settled in the region and populated the region of Europe. Then down in verse 8, the sons of Ham were Cush, that's the area of the upper Nile, Mizraim, which is the ancient name of Egypt, Put, which is the ancient name of Libya, and Canaan, so Africa, Egypt, the sons of Ham. Down in verse 17, the sons of Shem. The, the Shemites, or the Semites, you know, you've heard of anti-Semitism. A Semite is the race of the Jews and the Arabs. Notice another name given in verse 18, Arphaxad, don't name your son that, please, <laughs> begot Shelah, and Shelah begot Eber. Eber is the root word for Hebrew, just giving you some linguistic tie-ins. But look at this, verse 19, to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jotan. Now, some think that the idea of the earth being divided is when the continents began to drift, when the tectonic plates moved. I don't necessarily think that. I think that the idea of the earth being divided goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel, when the earth was divided by language groups, when God brought confusion because of that, that sin. Then, let me just have you look at verse 25 for a very simple reason, Eber Peleg Reu. I, I bring that to your attention. That is the shortest verse in the Old Testament. You might say, no big deal, but FYI. Then we have the descendants of Abraham that are given. First of all, the family of Ishmael. Ishmael was born of his marriage or his concubine relationship with uh, Hagar. And then next is the family of Keturah, which was his wife after Sarah died. And then backing up, we have the family of Isaac. And so the other ones are eliminated, and this line is now preserved. That's the focus. Verse 34, Abraham begot Isaac. The sons of Isaac were Esau and Israel. Now, his original name was Jacob, 
But God renamed him Israel, so he is given that title here. Then, in chapter 2, moving right along, um, he narrows down the focus. He began with the father of the human race by the name of Adam, right? That's verse 1 of chapter 1, Adam. So he begins with the father of the human race. He now narrows it down to the father of the Hebrew nation, the 12 tribes, the father of the leaders of the 12 tribes. These were, verse 1, the sons of Israel, or Jacob, and 12 names are given, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. So you're starting to see what he is doing genealogically. He's clearing the stage from all of the extraneous actors, the second-tier actors, if you will, and preserving the most important actors on the stage leading up to King David. And so he begins in verse 3, after announcing all the 12 tribes, the sons of Judah. Now, Judah was not the firstborn. In fact, we have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Judah was the fourthborn. But since Judah was the largest tribe and the foremost tribe, remember, Remember the prophecy back in Genesis 49? If not, let me just refresh your memory without you turning there. The prophecy is that the scepter, the kingship, the right to rule would not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, the Messiah comes. So the, the, the kingship, the kingdom would be occupied by the ruler, Judah, leading up to the Messiah. So Judah is a large tribe. It is foremost in the plan of God. So Judah is given the, the, the record first. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, and Shelah. These three were born to him by the daughter of Shua, the Canaanitess. Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he killed him. He was noteworthy. You may remember the story back in Genesis 38. If not later, later, you can look at it. We don't know what he did. Whatever he did, bad enough for God to kill him, and God killed him. I don't apologize for that. It says it. I, he did it. God can do whatever he wants. Right? Job said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So for whatever reason, his sin was wicked enough. But here's what, what I want to underscore. Sin is serious. And it disqualifies us. It ruins things. It ruins relationships. It ruins peace. It ruins our lives. And things happened to Ur. Sin cost him his right as the firstborn. Sin cost him his role in the messianic genealogy. And sin cost him his very life. So it's a very short verse, but there's insight there. Then verse 4, Tamar, the daughter-in-law, bore him Perez and Zerah. All the sons of Judah were five. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Zerah were Zimri, Ethan, Heman, Kalkol, Dara, five of them in all. The son of Carmi was Akar. Akar is a variant spelling of somebody I think you know of called Achan from the book of Joshua. Akar or Achan, the troubler of Israel. Achan means trouble. So when Achan was coming, maybe his name originally was Achar. It was changed to Achan, which means trouble. So they could say, here comes trouble. L literally, that was his name, Achan. The troubler of Israel who transgressed in the accursed things. Quick story. When the very first city in the promised land was taken, anybody know what that city was called? City of Jericho. 
When the city of Jericho was taken, God said, look, here's the deal. You're going to take all sorts of different cities in this land. You can have the spoil of all of those cities except the first one, Jericho. All the spoils belong to me, says the Lord. They'll be dedicated to me. They're under the ban. That is, you can't take the spoils for yourself. You give them all to the Lord because the first fruit begin, belongs to God. Well, Achan saw a Babylonian garment. I mean, it was just a good-looking piece of clothing. And it was his size. And he loved the color pattern. So he took it. And because he took it, God holds the entire congregation of Israel responsible. So when they fought the next battle, the little town, not the big town like Jericho, the little town of Ai, A-I, when they fought Ai, they, the children of Israel, were defeated. And they found out the reason they were defeated is because they allowed sin in the camp, in the midst, in the form of what Achan had done. So he was executed. So they wouldn't be Achan anymore, right? <laughs> He took care of that. You know, some things I just can't resist. Go down to verse 11. Nashon begot Salma. Salma begot who? Boaz. You remember Boaz, don't you? He married a gal from across the river named Ruth. Yeah, before he met Ruth. He was Ruthless. Now, he marries Ruth. And look, it's a list of names. I got to do something, right? To keep your attention. Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. Jesse is the father, of course, of David. Now, there's a list of names. In case you were wondering who didn't get picked to be king, after Saul, we have a list of who didn't get picked to be king. Jesse begot Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab the second, Shemaiah the third, Nethanel the fourth, Radai the fifth, Ozem the sixth, and David the seventh. Now we have a problem. The problem we have is if you were comparing this to the account in 1 Samuel chapter 16, it tells us that David was the eighth son. Now it says the seventh son. So I bring this up because some might want to bring this up and say, see, the Bible has contradictions. No contradiction at all. Obviously, one of the sons died. When Samuel came to the house at first, and there were seven sons, and, and David was the youngest, the eighth. They were still alive. Between that time and this time, we find out what happened. One of those sons died, probably as a young man, and David was now the seventh living son of Jesse. Now go over to chapter 3, moving right along. Look at us. We're narrowing it down to now David. David is highlighted. And all, get this, all 19 of his sons are mentioned. He was a prolific man. Chapter 3, verse 1. These were the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. The firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam the Jezreelitess. The second, Daniel by Abigail the Carmelitess. The third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmi, the king of Geshur, the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth, Shephatiah, by Abital. The sixth, Ethriam, by his wife, Eglah. These six were born to him in Hebron. There, that is in Hebron, he reigned seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years. We remember David had a reign, a total reign of 40 years and seven and a half were in Hebron, the rest were in Jerusalem. And there were born to him in Jerusalem Shemaiah, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. 
4 by Bathshua, that's a variant rendering of Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. Also, there were a list of these other names. Verse 9, these were all the sons of David beside the sons of the concubines and Tamar, their sister. Now, go back to verse 5 and notice the two names, Nathan and Solomon. You see them? Here's why they're important. Okay, I need your attention. When you get to the New Testament and you open up the book of Matthew, you find a genealogical record. The first 17 verses is a genealogy. When you get to the book of Luke, you also find a genealogy, right? The Gospel of Matthew is the genealogy of Jesus Christ through his adoptive father, Joseph, going back to David. And when he goes back to David through Joseph, he goes back to David through the line of Solomon, the son of David. When we get to the Gospel of Luke, we have a genealogical record with different names. It begins with Heli, the father of Mary, and goes back to David, not through Solomon, but through Nathan, his son. Two different sons. Why does he do that? Well, Solomon is the royal line, and so to show that Jesus has the legal right to rule as king, Messiah, he has the dynastic right to rule, he is in the family of Joseph, Joseph is not his biological father, but he is his legal father, so it shows that Jesus has the legal right to reign through Solomon to David. Luke takes a different tract and shows biologically all the way back to David, Mary was his biological mother. You say, well, so what? Why is that important? Here's why it's important. In Jeremiah chapter 22, one of the kings of Judah by the name of Kaniah or Jeconiah was cursed by God. His bloodline was cursed, saying no one from his progeny will ever sit on the throne. None of his sons, none of his grandsons, no one. I'm cutting off his line. Well, that, that poses a problem, because that's the legal line. That's the dynastic line. And so if the line of Jeconiah, the royal line of David, Solomon, etc., is cursed... How is the Messiah ever going to be the Messiah with a cursed bloodline? The only answer to that quandary would be one answer. It's impossible unless there's a virgin birth. The virgin birth solves the problem. Mary, the biological parent of Jesus, can go all the way back to David untainted, through Nathan, I'm, yeah, through Nathan to David. The legal right to rule comes through Joseph, even though the bloodline is cursed, that's okay, Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is. So you have a virgin-born Messiah, God is escaping his own curse by having his son born of a virgin. It's a masterful chess move. It's saying checkmate to the devil by a virgin birth. Just a little tidbit, important because the names appear together. I wanted to throw that in. Then uh, the family of Solomon is uh, beginning in verse 10. I'm going to take you down to verse, uh, to verse 1 of chapter 4 now. Look at us marching right along here. Uh, by the way, let me just take you back to chapter 3, verse 16. The sons of Jehoiakim were Jeconiah. There's his name, Jeconiah, or Kaniah, the one that was cursed, and his son Zedekiah. And then the family of Jeconiah is given. And then chapter 4, verse 1, the sons of Judah were Perez, Hezron, Carmi, Hur, and Shobal. And Reiah, the son of Shobal, begot 
Jahath, and Jahath begot Ahumai and Lahad. These were the families of the Zorathites. These were the sons of the father of Atom, Jezreel, Ishma, and Ibdash, and the name of their sister was Hazalel Pony. I just read those verses because I thought that name was kind of cool. <laughs> Hazalel Pony. I dare you to name your daughter that. <laughs> Go down to verse 9 now. We have a gem in verse 9. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. And so God granted him what he requested. Some of you may remember a book some years ago, an excellent little book put out by Bruce Wilkinson called The Prayer of Jabez, where he broke this apart. I, I love to study the prayers of the Bible. In fact, I think your praying would be better off if you prayed biblical prayers. I like the prayers of Paul in the letters. I like to emulate them and copy them, the, the uh, Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer that the Lord taught us, our Father. These are biblical prayers. And I love to study biblical prayers, especially those that are productive, those that are answered, those that work. And this one worked. The Lord granted him, it says, what he requested. Now, first of all, the name Jabez. The name Jabez means born of sorrow, born of sorrow, or born in pain, or of pain, or causing pain. And she said, I'm going to call his name painful, Jabez, because I bore him in pain. And then one of his prayers is, oh God, that you would keep me from evil, that I might not cause pain. Now, we don't know, but I'm guessing that either A, she had a very difficult delivery, a very painful delivery, giving birth to that little boy. Ow! I mean, it hurts anyway, from what I've observed. <laughs> but it seems that she had an extraordinarily difficult labor, a painful labor. Or he had a birth defect, and that brought her emotional pain as she saw him. And she was pained over it. Or maybe he was just a pain, period. <laughs> but he caused pain. And so he offers a prayer. And I love this prayer. It would be a whole message in and of itself. Well, it was a whole book. He obviously has a large concept of who God is. He called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Now, some people think it's selfish to pray for themselves. I shouldn't pray for myself. Yes, you should. Ask, Jesus said, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. You should pray for yourself. How can you give what you don't have? Ask God to bless you so that you can bless others. You know, blessings are like measles. You have to have them before you give them. <laughs> you have to be contagious. Have you ever been around a contagious person who's just blessed? And when you're, you're around them, you're blessed. You just love hanging out with them. Man, you're a blessing. So he prays, Lord, that you would bless me. And I love this, indeed. He didn't tell the Lord how to bless him, like, I pray that you bless me financially, hallelujah. Or, you know, bless me monetarily or bless me successfully in my business. He says, just bless me indeed. Lord, you know the best way to bless me. You see, God always gives his best. Listen, God always gives his best to those who leave the choice with him. He knows what's best. Father knows best. That's an old TV show. 
Father knows best. Leave it with him. Bless me indeed, whatever way you see fit. And enlarge my territory. And you could say, well, that just means he's selfish. He wants more for himself. Well, it could mean that, but it probably means more like this. Give me more to do. Give me more influence in people's lives so that I'm busy reaching them. Enlarge my territory, my border, actually, my influence. And that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil. You know, that's like the Lord's Prayer, that I might not cause pain. So it's a great prayer. I would recommend that you pray it for yourself. If if you're thinking, Skip, how can I pray for you? Pray this. (laughs) You know, just pray this. Lord, bless Skip. Indeed. Yes. Amen. I'll take that blessing. And just work your way through it, and I'll take it. And I like that. Don't let me ever cause pain. Let me give it to you a different way. Lord, don't let me get away with anything. Don't let me ever get away with anything. Because the greater territory you have and the greater influence you have, any misstep would indeed cause pain to so many. And one of my prayers is, Lord, just help me finish well, finish strong, not cause pain, not bring a reproach in any way to you. And the Lord granted him what he requested. Go down to verse 17. The sons of Ezra, different Ezra than the guy who wrote this book, spelled differently. The sons of Ezra were Jether, Mered, Ephor, Jalon. And Mered's wife bore Miriam, Shammai, Ishba, father of Eshtemoa, his wife, Jehudijah, Jehudijah, bore Jared, the father of Gidor, Heber, the father of Soko, and Jek, the hard name, the father of Zanoah. I'm getting to a name I want you to see. And these were the sons of Bethiah, watch this, watch this, the daughter of Pharaoh, whom Mered took. Now, what makes this noteworthy is women were typically not included in genealogies unless there were unusual circumstances, and this is one of them. You have an Egyptian woman, the daughter of Pharaoh, who is given the Hebrew name Bithia or Batia in Hebrew. Batia means daughter of Yahweh. She's Pharaoh's daughter. She's given the name God's daughter. Not Pharaoh's daughter, God's daughter. Evidently, she left Egypt and forsook Egypt and decided to make the people of God her people. Even though she was the daughter of Pharaoh, she married an Israelite and was on the move, leaving Egypt. Many scholars and Jewish sources especially believe this is the woman that found Moses at the Nile, took care of Moses, and saw the plan of God through the Israelites when Moses rescued his people. And she, the daughter of Pharaoh, the one who raised him, left Egypt, forsook Egypt, along with Moses and was on the move with them. So it's a beautiful, beautiful little picture. Chapter 5, we have the family of Reuben. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn. That's the firstborn of Jacob. He was indeed the firstborn. Notice, notice this note. He was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. So let me just unravel this. I wish I had time to take you back. I won't, but would you just write this little thing down and look at it later? Read Genesis chapter 49. In Genesis chapter 49, Jacob He's on his deathbed. He's 147 years old. It's time for that old guy to die. He's 147. 
And yet his mind is sharp. And he goes through the list of all of his sons, beginning with Reuben, and shows that Reuben is knocked out of the place of receiving the blessing of the firstborn. And then we get down to Joseph, the longest oracle in that chapter. And how the word bless, blessing, blessing, blessing is used for Joseph. And the blessing of the firstborn, the double portion goes to Joseph to his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so we're giving a little, given a little bit of commentary as to why that happened here in chapter 5 of 1 Chronicles, going through the history. Now go over to verse 25. Well, verse 23, so the children of the half-tribe of Manasseh dwelt in the land. Their numbers increased from Bashan to Baal Hermon, Hermon, that is to Senir or Mount Hermon, that mountain way up Hermon, way up in the north that you can see. If you come with us to Israel, if Israel opens up again, uh, you'll see Mount Hermon one day. These were the heads of their father's house, Ephor, Ishi, Eliel, Azrael, Jeremiah, different Jeremiah, Hodaviah, Jadiel. They were mighty men of valor, famous men, heads of their father's houses. And they were unfaithful to the God of their fathers and played the harlot after the gods of the people of the land whom God had destroyed before them. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pool, the king of Assyria, that is Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, he carried the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half-tribe of Manasseh into captivity. He took them to Hala, Habor, Hara, and the river of Gozan to this day. This chapter, chapter 5, talks about two and a half tribes. Two and a half tribes. Um, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh who decided when they were coming into the land, they didn't want to go into the land. Let me just refresh your memory. Numbers chapter 32. They're coming into the land. They're on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And two and a half tribes say, hey, Moses, man, the land up here is awesome. We're cattlemen and the grass is green and there's lots of trees and water and it's, we can grow pistachios, and I mean, it really is a great area. We don't want to go into the promised land. We'd like to stay on the other side of the Jordan River and just settle there. And Joseph, uh, Moses said, what on earth are you talking about? I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He said, why discourage ye the hearts of the people? By coming up with that request. And so they said, tell you what, Moses, we'll go with you into the land and fight the enemies, but when it's all said and done, we'd like to come back here. Because they like the land. So, God promised them the land of Canaan. Two and a half tribes basically said, we don't want what God has for us. We like living on the edge. And they lived on the border. Because they were living on the edge, living on the border, the very first ones that you would come in contact with if you were Assyria or Babylon coming from the northeast would be those two and a half tribes. They went into captivity first. They fell first in 722 B.C. to the Assyrians. So be careful when you want to just live on the edge and stay, you know, I'm saved, but I want to stay close to the border of where I just got saved. No, no, go all the way in, cross the river, burn the bridges, get to a safe spot. A little girl fell out of her bed at night and she cried and mom came in the room and she said, honey, what happened? And the little girl said, I think I stayed too close to where I got in. If you stay on the edge of the bed, you're apt to fall out. If you move to the center, you'll be a little bit safer. Move in. Get closer. Now chapter 6, the family of Levi. Levi was the third son of Jacob. Levi was the priestly tribe. Notice the three sons of Levi are mentioned. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And their names and genealogies are given. I'm not going to get into all of it. Except to say, these three families took care of the tabernacle. 
took care of the temple. Uh, they were in charge of the priesthood. The, the tribe of Levi is the priestly tribe. The Old Testament, the Jews of the Old Testament had a priesthood. In the New Testament, there is no priesthood. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And because Jesus is the great high priest, taking the place of Aaron, because he's after the order of Melchizedek, as you remember in Hebrews, Peter says, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. So you're a priest along with the great high priest. You don't need to go through a human being to get to God, a priest. You go directly through the great high priest into the presence of God, and you are a priest. I'll never forget the look on my mother's face, raised Roman Catholic, how I said to her, Mom, your wish has been granted. I'm a priest. <laughs> You've always wanted a son who would join the priesthood. You've got one. I'm it. And she gave me the strangest look, and then I went on to explain that in the New Testament, all believers are priests. Well, she didn't like my explanation. <laughs> we get through the chapter, a couple things to mention. Verse 28 mentions Samuel. That is Samuel the prophet, the last judge he is mentioned. He's the son of Elkanah. The sons of Merari are given, and they form the musicians. Verse 31, these are the men whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord. After the ark came to rest, they were ministering with music before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of meeting until Solomon built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So these were those who, and I love describing them as ministering to the Lord. They weren't putting on a show. They're ministering to the Lord. You know, our worship team makes sure that they're not putting on a show. They're worship leaders, but really they're lead worshipers. They're just worshiping, hoping you'll come into the throne room along with them. Ministering to the Lord. It's all about the Lord, all about him. A couple of things to note about this group of musicians and singers. I just want to point it out. Look in verse 33. You see where it says... Um, he-Man, the singer. This was a real big guy, a He-Man. No, this is a Haman or He-Man, the singer. This is that was a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> He-Man is the author of Psalm 88. The inscription above Psalm 88 reads He-Man, and uh, he was no doubt the author of that psalm. Then look at verse 39, and his brother Asaph. That's a familiar name. Asaph wrote Psalm 50 and Psalm 73 through Psalm 83. A total of 12 psalms are under the authorship of Asaph. And then look at verse 44. We have the name of Ethan, the son of Kishi. Ethan was the author of Psalm 89. And verse 48, And their brethren, the Levites, were appointed to every kind of service, of the tabernacle of the house of God. But Aaron, verse 49, and his sons offered sacrifices on the altar of burnt offering, on the altar of incense, for all the work of the most holy place. Aaron and his family would occupy the high priesthood, and that would be passed down from generation to generation. Now in chapter 7, six tribes are mentioned. Again, these are not complete genealogical records. They are very selective. Some names are mentioned, then dropped, and the focus is narrowed. So we have six tribes, Issachar, Benjamin, Naphtali, Manasseh on the west or left side of the Jordan River. Uh, this is worth mentioning, verse 14, the descendants of Manasseh, his Syrian concubine, bore him Machir, the father of Gilead, the father of Asriel. Machir took as his wife the sister of Hupim and Shupim, whose name was Ma'aka. The name of Gilead's grandson was Zalafahad, but Zalafahad begot only daughters. Now let me jog your memory. Numbers chapter 27. The five daughters of Zalafahad, or Zalafahad, approached Moses. 
because there was a problem. The problem is, in families, property gets passed to the firstborn son. He had no firstborn son or secondborn son or son at all. He just had five gals. So the first woman's rights movement was back in the book of Numbers, chapter 27. They came to Moses and said, hey, what's up? You know, I mean, you know, we have we're f these five daughters. And Moses took it before the Lord, and the Lord said, they're right. Make sure that these gals get their inheritance just like the guys would. So uh, their boldness paid off. Now, this is important because other cultures, Arab cultures, the Indian culture, women are not treated equally like men. Women are sold as property. Uh, in Yemen, women are illiterate. In Saudi Arabia, until recently, they haven't been able to drive, haven't been, are not able to vote. Um, in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood says women should be kept at home and never taken out in public. Just shut them away. Don't let people see them. So uh, quite a difference. Way back in the Old Testament, God is championing, championing these gals. That takes us now to chapter 8. Benjamin begot Bila, his firstborn. Ashbel, the second. Ahara, the third. Now he's setting the stage for the life and ministry and monarchy of King David. So Benjamin was a tribe from which King Saul comes from. Judah, the tribe of Judah, and Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, and two other tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. Remember in Nehemiah when the people come back to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem? Those are the four tribes they come from. Most of them are from Judah and Benjamin, and then a few from Ephraim and Manasseh. They come back. Um, verse 33 mentions Ner begot Kish, Kish begot Saul, that's the first king of Israel. Saul begot Jonathan, Malkishua, Abinadab, Eth Baal. Chapter 9. We're going to finish chapter 9. All Israel was recorded by genealogies, and indeed they were inscribed in the book of the kings of Israel, but Judah was carried away captive to Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. And the first inhabitants who dwelt in their possessions in their cities were Israelites, priests, Levites, and the Nethanim, that is, the servants. Now in Jerusalem, the children of Israel dwelt, and some of the children of Benjamin, the children of Ephraim, and Manasseh. Those are the four tribes I mentioned. You see what he's doing? He's now taking you to the end of the Babylonian captivity, the return of the people to Jerusalem. That's why I say this book was written after the captivity, because he's now writing that these are the people that populated and came back into the land. So these are those who returned. And verse 21, Zechariah, son of this guy, was the keeper of the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the gatekeepers are listed, all 212, uh, or 212 are mentioned, who were doorkeepers, gatekeepers in the house of the Lord. Remember what it says in Psalms, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Let's end here. Verse 35, chapter 9. Jeiel, the father of Gibeon, whose wife name was Ma'akah, dwelt at Gibeon. His firstborn son was Abdon, then Zur, Kish, Baal, Ner, Nadab, Gedor, Ohio, not Ohio, Zechariah, and Mil, Mikloth. Mikloth begot Shimeam, and they dwelt alongside their relatives in Jerusalem with their brethren. Ner begot Kish, Kish begot Saul, Saul begot Jonathan, Malkishua, Abinadab, and Eshbal. So Saul is mentioned again because the genealogical record stops at the end of chapter 9. The narrative, the kind of stuff you and I can get into and read, the stories begin in chapter 10. The, the history picks up. The genealogies are done, but 
they want to take you all the way up to King David, the death of Saul and the reign of King David. So uh, we have covered 3,000 years of history uh, in about an hour. Let's just close again by realizing that people are important to God. All people are important to God. You are important to God. God knows your name. God knows your thoughts. God knows the cry of your heart, and he cares so much. And some of the names here, it's like, you know, you got all these names, but then you mention the guy who saw the Babylonian garment, and he'll always be a blot on the record in that family. Yeah, be careful how you choose and how you live your life. Because a life of sin not only doesn't pay, but it becomes a blot on the family record. And so, by God's grace, live for his glory. Father, thank you for an opportunity to cover these nine chapters, this long record of those who lived and those who died and those men and women that you raised up to bring to us David and then eventually the son of David, the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for the fact that he is a lamb without spot, without blemish, as attested to by the genealogies. Thank you for hungry hearts, brave souls who have gathered together to hear these chapters. In Jesus' name, amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.